Merry Christmas. We're glad you've chosen to join us for this worship time at Kyoki Baptist Church in Appling, Georgia. God is doing something in our midst, and we're excited that you're a part of it. It's Christmas at Kyoki, and you're invited to celebrate the Savior's birth with us. For calendar events, worship service times, and all other general information, please go to kyoki.org. If you'd like to support the ministry of Kyoki financially, you can give securely here on our website. In a few minutes, we'll open our Bibles to read and hear God's message. But right now, let's sing together in worship of Jesus Christ. Welcome. It is, uh, once again, really good to have you with us. And guess what? We have made it to the week of Christmas. Uh, I hope that's a good thing for you. I know that for many it is uh, somewhat of a tender uh, and even bittersweet reality. But when we consider what Christmas, who Christmas is really all about, um, even in the saddest of circumstances, it is something that... Uh, is amazingly glorious because it is about the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we are going to look at God's Word as He conveys that truth to us through the book of Isaiah. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter, we're going to start in chapter 8 and then land in chapter 9. But before we get there, I want to ask you a question, and that is if you could have one gift at Christmas what would it be? One gift. Now, you can't ask for, it can't be the famous, well, I'd ask for a thousand other wishes. That one doesn't work. Answers to that, probably, if, 
you, we were in a room of 100 people would go from the frivolous, well, I'd like another, a, a larger Swiss chalet, to the serious, I'd like enough food to share so that my whole family could have a meal together. To maybe the despondent, I would choose, I would have there be a flicker of light in the darkness of my life. Now maybe you fit somewhere at, at one of those. If you're needing a larger Swiss chalet, you need to, uh, you need to give my financial advisor a call. Um, but maybe you're struggling. Maybe you don't have a home, or maybe uh, you are in serious financial uh, trouble. Or maybe when you look, maybe not so much w with your physical eyes, but with the eyes of your heart and in the eyes of your soul, all you see is the dark. Well, as we enter this Christmas week, we are closing out our series on anticipating Christmas. And we realize that for some people, Christmas anticipation is not necessarily all raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens, but rather it produces anxiety, produces thoughts of failure, thoughts of never measuring up, reminders of loss, even tremendous sorrow during the holidays. Well, the prophet Isaiah lived during a time when all of the above engulfed God's people. He was a prophet to the nation of Judah. And during this time of dismay, God gave a word, a promise of hope. Now, throughout this series, we started out looking at a very unique birth, the amazing birth of Jesus Christ. A virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son. Then we looked at a very unique life um, in Isaiah chapter 42, the first of the servant songs found in Isaiah. And then last week we looked at chapters 52 and 53, the last of the servant songs, and saw his was the, the most unique death there ever was. So to close out our series, today we're going to look at a very unique kingdom. A very unique kingdom. Now, the very meaning of a kingdom implies a king, a ruler. And in Isaiah's day, which was the 8th century B.C., 700 years before Christ was born, in his day people knew all about kings that were failures, that were self-serving, that were reckless, that were faithless. But the king that God promised would be different. So, let's get started. Um, today, we're going to look at what happens in this very unique kingdom. What happens when darkness flees. When darkness flees. So, Isaiah chapter 8 it actually is just the background. It's the setting to what we're going to see in chapter 9, but it is all-important background. Anytime you come to the Word of God and you read a particular passage and maybe you're not going that sp through that specific book for whatever reason you want to read a passage, it really is important to understand the context of what you're reading. So I would encourage you to to read at least the, what immediately precedes that passage. And sometimes, as is often the case in the Apostle Paul, you might even need to go back a chapter or two, or even further back than that. But in this case, what immediately precedes chapter 9 is, uh, is a really good picture of what's going on in the life of of God's people. So let's just start in verse 16 and we'll read through the end of the chapter and it will set up our first the first element 
of when darkness flees in this very unique kingdom. So, verse 16. Bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for Yahweh, who is hiding His face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in Him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts, who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the teaching and to the testimony? If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness." Now this is obviously a very emotional, a very stark, bleak picture of what God sees in the midst of His people. His people, if you, you will recall, we'll go back a few weeks to Isaiah chapter 7 when we talked about what immediately precedes the sign that God gives King Ahaz when he, when he offers to Ahaz, ask any sign and I will give it to you, remember? And Ahaz says, oh no, I wouldn't ask that of the Lord. I wouldn't ask that of you. And so God gives him a sign anyway, and the sign was that a virgin, a virgin shall shall conceive a child and give birth, and his name will be Emmanuel, which literally means God with us. It's a great, great look forward, a messianic prophecy of the birth of the coming Savior. Well, in this passage, there's no indication of a Savior. There's no promise. There's no hope. God's people have, um, have abandoned the God who called them, the God who made them a people. And just, uh, just a couple of lines through here that really stand out and I think set the back, backdrop of the situation. Notice what's going on. They have, the, instead of coming to the Lord, they have gone to mediums and the necromancers, those that convert and communicate wink wink with the dead should they not should not a people inquire of their god there's a little tinge of sarcasm in the lord's words here should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living to the teaching and to the testimony if they will not speak according to His Word, it is because they have no dawn. And all of a sudden, with this, this picture of darkness begins to drop. They will pass through this land greatly distressed and hungry. Now, the hunger not only would be a physical hunger in this particular historical setting, but it was very much a spiritual hunger. The problem is they are feeding on things that will never quench that hunger. Because when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. They will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness so what a powerful picture that we have here this 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 setting and here's the point for darkness to flee the the first thing that that we really need to kind of wrap our hands around and what was going on 2700 years ago is that the great danger that leads to darkness 
is replacing God. Let me say that again. The great danger, not, not only for the people of Judah, they, they stand out as a, as, a, as a tremendous example to us, but for you and for me, the great danger that leads to your own personal darkness is seeking to replace God. And here's what I mean by that. For most of us, the great error in our lives is not rejecting God. Most people are not atheists. You know, the most current surveys, some have it as high as 94% of Americans believe in, in a God. The lowest figures I've seen are 80%, and for about 10 to 15 of the percent above that 80, they just don't know. Most people believe in God. Most people that claim some type of relationship with Christ, thankfully, believe in a God. It's not that, it's not that, that we have rejected the Lord, but that we simply replace Him in our lives. That's what they've done. If you were to go up on the streets during Isaiah's time to the people of Judah, most of them could quote Scripture to you. Most of them were believers in the Lord. They would laugh at you if you asked them if they believed in Yahweh, in God. But what's happened is, in all practicality, they're atheists. They have, re they have replaced the Lord the role that He demands, not just in their lives, but in our lives. I mean, think, think about it. We, we allow God access to part of our lives, but we really don't trust Him with all of it far too often. We tend to take matters into our own hands. We get disappointed with our spouse, in our spouse, and so we little bit by little bit begin to pull away, spend less and less time, find other people more engaging, and wonder, what have we done? Why do I have to be stuck with this guy or this girl? We get angry at the circumstances of our lives that we find ourselves in, and, and we grow bitter, You get cynical. Everything starts to just... Instead of looking at the positive, you, we begin to look at the negative. Even God, darkness begins to overshadow His sacred light. Our friends, we treat different. Or, watch, we find new friends won't hold us quite as accountable won't ask us the tough questions, won't challenge us when missing the worship of God's people one week leads into two weeks, into three weeks, into a month, a second month, a third month. Our new friends don't worry about that. They don't go. So instead of hearing people that genuinely care about us, care about us, we find friends that care about us in a different way and ultimately you know i mean I, I you you find the church doesn't you know that there's your excuse you blame it on the church the music has changed sunday school teaching is not the bible study is not as edifying as it once was the the preaching is getting longer and longer it's just not practical enough for my life we it's not that we reject god we just replace him with what we think is better. The sin of Judah was the sin of idolatry. Well, the sin of idolatry has not gone away in 2,700 years. We just think that term is a little bit too pagan, so we never talk about idolatry. But we have idols. We have idols. I, I, I want to challenge you. Maybe, maybe you want to do it right now. 
hit the pause button. Go before the Lord. I, I, listen, I, I don't dare you. I double dare you. God is good to His Word. Spend some time in prayer. Ask Him, Father, show me the idols in my life. Pull them out. Help me to turn from them, to run from them. Forbid me, God. Don't allow me to replace you. For I know that there is nothing better than you. Okay. Here's the second aspect of, uh, of what happens, what compels, what drives darkness away. And that is the promise of a light that is greater than the darkness. The promise of a light that is greater than the darkness. And that's what happens in, in chapter 9. And, 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 and immediately, in verse 1, remember uh, chapter 8 ends, and they will be thrust into th- thick darkness. But get this, not everybody will be. <laughs> One of the great realities in the Old Testament, especially Isaiah speaks of this, Uh, often and that is God always has a remnant Paul is reminds the Rome his Roman readers in the book of Romans uh, that God all has always had a remnant in other words a people of his own possession within the larger picture of people who claim him but don't know him Well, there is a remnant, there is a group of people that not only claim God, but they claim Him because they know Him because He knows them. He knows them. Their hearts are new. It is the mark, it is the identifier of a Christian, a follower of Jesus. We know because we are known. So let's read it. This powerful passage. Verse 1 of chapter 9. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee, of the nations. Some of your translations say Galilee of the Gentiles. Verse, verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased the joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Oh, there is a light, a promised light that is greater than than the darkness. Now, all of us experience darkness in our lives, right? I mean, from time to time, we go through periods. Not just people that suffer from psychological and mental issues. Those are, those are real. But we all get depressed. We all hit these blue periods of our lives. And generally, it is because of circumstances issues that arise maybe at work maybe at home often because we begin not rejecting the lord but because we begin replacing him but even the holiest of people read their biographies even the great apostle paul went through periods of darkness Ray Ortland has written that life is full of braggarts and bullies. God's answer to the bully swaggering through history is not to become an even bigger bully. His answer is Jesus. 
I love that. I love that. God doesn't have to bow up. God doesn't have to uh, put on the boxing gloves. God just sends His Son. And in doing so, He sends Himself. God gives this promise. And listen, I I realize, and and let's be honest with this text, uh, there is a, um, and we're going to see it in the third and final point as well, so I'm just going to go ahead and address it now. There is a sense in which there is still darkness amongst us, right? And there's political darkness, there's social darkness, there's cultural darkness, there's personal darkness. It's what, it's what I just mentioned, what the Apostle Paul writes about in Romans chapter 6 and 7. It's not that the light has totally dispelled the darkness yet. We all know the pain and sorrow of breathing, of loved ones that get sick and die and and leave and, and relationships that get broken. So what's going on? Why hasn't the darkness been put away with? Well, the answer is found in the first part of verse 6 when he tells us, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. This is the same child, it's the same son that is referred to in chapter 7, verse 14, whose name will be Emmanuel, God with us. The child has come. Light is has appeared on the scene. And at Jesus' first advent, when He came the first time, this is Christmas, we celebrate now His first advent. And when He came, He came to take away our sin. You see, the problem with the people of Judah is the same problem with the people of America and the people of England and the people of China and the people of Tunisia and the people of South Africa and the people all over the world. The darkness is not just emotional and it's not just mental. It's not just life. The problem, the darkness is our sin. And so Jesus came 700 years after Isaiah prophesied about His coming. 2,000 years before today, He came to take away our sin. Their problem was sin. And Jesus, in His first advent, as we celebrate it at Christmas time, has come and has taken away for those that will receive him in faith he takes away our sin and the stain and the blight of our moral failing our impurity our sinful heart and sinful ways has been washed away oh precious is the flow that cleanses white as snow No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's His first advent. But one day, He will come again. And when He does, He will take away our pain and our suffering. Our sin has been gone. And for those, when He comes again, when the trumpet blasts, and the skies part, and every eye shall see Him. For those that stand forgiven in the family of God because of the salvation of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in that, (laughs) our pain and our suffering our tears will be gone.
There will be no darkness. <laughs> there will be no darkness when the Lord returns. And get this. John tells us in the book of Revelation, not only will there be no darkness, but there will be no sun. There will be no moon. There will be no need for them. Because God Himself will be our light. Now listen, the first advent had to be in the providence and plan of the Father. But the second advent, oh, talk about glorious. Talk about glorious. There is a light that is greater than the darkness. And that light is Jesus Himself. Okay, very quickly, I want to give you a third aspect of what causes darkness to flee. And that is that Jesus is God's answer to the darkness. We've talked about it. Um, we have even begun to read the fact that to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Listen to this description of this child. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Listen, um, there is much to digest here and, and time won't allow us to deal with it um, in its totality. Let me just say, address these titles just as Emmanuel was a title of Jesus, the Messiah, so too are these four uh, references. They are titles of this child, this son that is given. We don't demand him. He is given to us. Wonderful counselor. Anybody can give counsel. <laughs> You or I could go out and set up a sign that says counsel, counsel. But not everybody gives wonderful counselor. Wonderful counsel. Not everybody gives 100% truthful, honest counsel. Ours is a wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. The reason he's a wonderful counselor is because he is a mighty God. And there's something in this uh, title of Mighty God that speaks, I believe, to transformation. This Mighty God will change us from the inside out so that the rot and the decay of our hearts is made new. It is transformed. What was once dead is now made alive by this mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. We have said of Jesus that not only is He eternal, He is before time, He has always existed, and He always will exist as God. He is everlasting, but He is the source. Paul writes about in Colossians, He is the source of of all creations. And listen to this in Hebrews chapter 1. This is God the Father speaking of Jesus, God the Son. And listen to what the writer of Hebrews says. But of the Son, He, that's the Father, he, uh, but of the Son, He says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain." They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment day. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same, 
and your years will have no end. Now, is that not an amazing passage? That is God the Father speaking and calling the Son Lord. And what is happening is the Father is acknowledging that the Son has full rights and He speaks for the Father. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And we think we have a handle on that. I don't think we've come close to having a handle on that. I think Hebrews 1, that passage we just looked at, is indicative of that. But He is the everlasting Father. And finally, He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. It is no coincidence that at this time of the year we talk about peace. Remember, we looked last Sunday, we, we just broached the subject, and, and come Christmas Eve, we will um, read the glorious passage of the angel appearing to the shepherds. And you remember during the song of the angels to the shepherds, they say, they sing, there's peace on earth. Peace on earth. Well, obviously total peace has not come. We live in a time of wars. We live in a time where nation rises up against nation. But the day is coming where there will be an actual peace. There will be no more war. But here's, here's the amazing thing about this amazing Savior. That in the midst of of a world that is chaotic there is peace to be found personal peace in fact this savior is the prince of peace so i uh let's close out let's close out right here of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore. Our country has just come through a very trying time of election. In fact, we're still in it, especially if you're in the state of Georgia. Television commercials scream at you every hour seems like every minute of every hour but certainly every hour of every day that there is an election coming up after the first of the year and half of the country is happy and half of the country is mad as a hornet but this prince this everlasting father this mighty god this wonderful wonderful counselor this child that is born, the Son that has been given to us, Jesus, He gives something that no Republican and no Democrat could ever give. No president, no earthly king or ruler. He gives light in the midst of the darkness. And when Jesus comes, the darkness will flee. And one day He's coming again and He will dispel darkness once and for all. But my question for you, for us, is have we let the darkness of the, of the enemy, of the evil one, have we let the darkness of the cares of this world, have we let the darkness that just comes when we replace God with other things have we let it take hold take dominion in our lives and in doing so we find ourselves in the quicksand that is darkness it doesn't have to be that way it does not have to be that way Jesus Christ desires to dispel the darkness that's in your heart, it's in your mind, it's in your soul. If you will come to Him and trust Him in faith and receive Him as your Lord and Savior. If you are a Christian, it might be that you need to come home. 
And you need to lay down those things that you have found so handy in your moving away from God. And you need to repent. The good news is that He loves you and He desires for you to know Him and to know this amazing light, the light of Christ, our Savior and King. Let's pray. Father, for everyone that's watching this, that's listening to my voice, God, I just pray that you would bless them, that this Christmas, whatever their financial or emotional or just life circumstances where, where, they, where it finds them, I pray that you would, um, that Lord, you would envelop them and you would surround them with your tender, gracious mercy. Hold them close. And God, that you would open closed and blind eyes to the light of Jesus Christ, to the person of Jesus Christ. For the light is found in Jesus. And Lord, may they be able to taste. Even if it's through the tears of difficulty, may they be able to taste the sweetness of your presence this Christmas. God, we love you. And we thank you for not only the first coming of Jesus, but God, in faith, we look forward to his coming again. And we do so and we pray this and ask this in his holy name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being with us. We're going to close out with a song of praise, and we uh, invite you to stay with us and focus on the words that are being sung. Merry Christmas. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for Oh, so.